I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome to the Q&A, everyone. Tom, let's go ahead and jump right in. I know we got lots of questions, I'm sure. We do, absolutely. And real quick, I just want to say thank you for everybody for uh, liking and subscribing. And if you like the show and you want to let us know, like and subscribe if you haven't done so. And you can also support the show. We have a link to Patreon in the description. Um, so we're going to start right off with questions. And uh, question number one is, this would be for Will and Forrest. What do Bigfoot have on the bottoms of their feet? What what do they have? And I'm assuming this person wants to know in terms of pads. I was going to say, it depends on what they've been walking in. <laughs> Uh, it does. Yes. There. Okay. Question answered. On to the next one. Uh, Forrest, you'd probably be more qualified than me to talk about that. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, all all monkeys have uh, a, a certain amount of padding on the bottom of their foot and their hands uh, because all uh, monkeys and apes are quadrupedal, and uh, even though they do walk bipedally uh, occasionally. But they do have uh, padding on their feet. And from what I can tell from the, the footprints that I've had around here and the footprints that I have seen, uh, they do have a pad uh, on the bottom of their feet, which uh, people do have to realize that even with the padding, they still exhibit the dermal ridges and uh, such as that. So uh, that's what it is. I mean, and, and they'd have to have padding to be able to walk through the type of uh, uh environment that they do so uh that's just natural and I'm, I'm sure it would be something kind of akin to what you would find on the bottom of your um uh cats and dogs and that's usually what you find uh very similar on the bottoms of uh, uh the feet and hands of uh, monkeys and and apes i guess the only thing i doubt is i have quite a few casts in my collection and and just about all of them exhibit what appears to be a very thick pad. Uh, so that goes right in line with what you're saying. Yeah. All right, Tom. Okay, so the next question is, uh, this has to do with the Bigfoot hair. What would you expect Bigfoot to have a winter and summer coat like other animals in northern climates? Uh, do Are they going to get a noticeably thicker coat uh, during the winter months, and do they shed in the spring? I would say they wouldn't. Don't shed. No, I mean not like cats or dogs. What do you think, Forrest? Okay. Well, uh, some of your monkeys that are live in the, the colder climes, like your uh, Japanese macaques, they do uh, shed to a certain degree. Uh, they have a much much heavier coat in the winter time than they do in the summertime. But if you look at uh, uh, chimpanzees and and gorillas and orangutans, uh, your great apes, gibbons, and they maintain a hair coat pretty much the same all year round. And I would suspect that Bigfoot would probably be pretty much the same. All right. So this person has a couple of follow-up questions. Do you know of any reliable hair samples taken from a Bigfoot, and are there any particular or identifying hair characteristics unique to Bigfoot? What about the different Bigfoot types? I think what they're asking is, if there's different hair samples, would maybe a type three have a different hair type than type four, type one? Um, Any thoughts? I I wouldn't think they'd be much different. Uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts, Forrest? No, I, I would uh, agree with that, that there'd probably not be a whole lot of difference in the, the types, actually, in the hair. hair. I mean, good hair questions, is though. Hair. And a lot of the hair right. samples, and, you know, samples are taken a lot by people out and about, 
And, I mean, unless you pull one right off the creature, you can't for 100% say that that is or isn't Sasquatch hair. Yeah, you got to have, have a sample to compare it to. Now, we do know that, uh, uh, my gosh, supposed DNA tests on uh, hair samples that were uh, taken. And, <clears throat> uh, of course, to get DNA, you got to have the root and everything else involved too and i would imagine that they're uh the structure you know all this the the structure of a hair is different for, i mean you can tell the, the difference in a, a dog's hair versus a human hair or a cat's or something like that and don't get me to lying and saying that i know how what what makes up all of them because i don't and uh so uh it's the same way same way with different monkeys and apes they're uh, the structure and the interior structure when put under a microscope it all it, it all varies so you have to have a comparative sample to uh, be able to identify where where it comes from well a good point and here's um here's a really interesting same person um they have they sent us three questions so we like these. These are great. Do are there any hair samples of a Neanderthal or earlier hominid um, for us? Are you are you aware of anything? No, I am not. That would be wonderful if we had it, but uh, uh, there isn't. Not to my knowledge, I there knew, isn't. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be great. You'd almost, I mean, you'd have to what find a skeleton with some hair still on the on the skull or something. I think it'd be, it might well, be a and, toughie. And that would be for, I mean, you know, th that many thousands of years to have hair, something as fragile as hair to uh, last that long. It's just not going to happen. So, um, you know, I don't even imagine, I can't even imagine the right kind of conditions for that happening. Well, and the last question this person wants to know, and I think what they're what they're driving at, I'm just going to guess that they said, except for Japanese macaques, I can't think of many primates that live in an area with freezing temperatures for a substantial period of the year. And well, there's one that does. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Take it away, Will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. You know, you're, you're looking at current existing apes that live out and about. Uh, those are in more, you know, tropical type regions. But um, uh, we don't know what was here before, you know, in, in the wide ranging environments they lived in. So uh, when it comes to the Sasquatch, they seem to be very adaptable to all sorts of environments. So uh, I guess it's reasonable to, to assume that maybe some of the more archaic ones that don't exist any, anymore may have been, too. Well, and who's to say, you know, what the archaic version of uh, Bigfoot was? Uh, we don't know what that is. Obviously, Bigfoot had to evolve into what he is today from uh, from some other form. I don't think that he progressed uh, all these millions of years and remained the same. I mean, he might have, but I don't know of any other uh, apes, monkeys, uh, or men, or man, that has done that. So I, I'm uh, assuming that they would have evolved from another uh type of, uh, you know, ape into what they are today. Now, I am suspecting that maybe what he's getting at when he said the colder climbs and such, and a lot of, and he was asking about Neanderthal, and I may be wrong in where he's headed with this question, but I'm just going to slip in here and say something. A lot of people operate with a, a misconception that Neanderthal existed only in cold climates. Um, yes, they did. They did they were quite well adapted to the colder climates of Europe during the, the glacial and interstadial glacial periods. Uh, but you also find Neanderthal settlements and what they're, they're finding them now in tropical climates and in uh, the Middle East. Uh, there, there's a big site in, uh, in the Middle East. So uh, they were man, man, and I don't care in what variety that he came out in, he was adaptable, just like uh, most, you know, most of your apes and monkeys are too. So, good point. I want to do a little follow up on that. 
um, and this is conjecture, but one of the questions I think I've had in my mind for a long time is you go to Alaska, you've got a Bigfoot up there that just thrives in subarctic temperatures that would kill anybody else. And then you've got Texas, where you don't get a whole lot of subarctic temperatures. It is blazing hot. What do you think? Could you grab one of the creatures from Alaska, drop them down into Texas and vice versa? And do you think they would do fine? Or do you think they are regional differences with these creatures that are more adapted to either a super cold climate or a very, very hot climate? Well, not knowing what the adaptations actually exist there in each uh for each animal in each locale, uh, it would I think it would be difficult to take one from Texas and drop them in Alaska and expect them to do well up there. Uh, first off, they've been they were brought up in this type of climate, and vice versa. I don't think a, 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 an ape that's been living in the region of Alaska and Canada, and we know they're all over Canada, and we they've been seen all over Alaska too, are going to. Uh, do well in a climate down here and i it's it uh it remains to be <laughs> seen like people i mean uh i having having lived in alaska and having lived in texas there's stresses upon myself that uh, i find i find in texas that you know of course now with the heat i can come in and, and it's uh i'm in an air-conditioned building so i can control my environment bigfoot can't do that uh, he can't go down to the local Walmart. Well, I guess he could if he could figure out some way to make some money and go in and pay for that <laughs> air conditioner. But, I, you know, uh, I'm being funny there because we know that's not going to happen. So vice versa, uh, you're not going to have Bigfoot going to the local Walmart to buy uh, a heater either. So, uh, you know, it's they, we, we as humans uh, control our environment. They can't. So I, I wouldn't think that one that has been born and lived its life in Alaska, if you take that and pick it up and bring it over here and uh, drop it in my backyard, he is not going to be a happy Bigfoot. And I personally wouldn't want him in my backyard not being a happy Bigfoot. But, uh, uh, you know, it's it's all, I think, what you've learned to, or you your body has adapted to. Uh, and, you know, like I say, man can control their environment. Uh, a Bigfoot certainly can't. You know, I, I just figured something out, Forrest. When they were trying What's to that? get your air conditioning, they weren't going to buy one. They were going to steal yours. <laughs> oh, they were going to steal <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> so, damn, we want that. <laughs> See? We need that. Just a little examination, and you figure out what's going on. They me to get one, and I'm going to get one. <laughs> but I agree with you. I think when they're, they're acclimated over generations to a certain region, uh, they probably wouldn't wouldn't like very well being outside of that region, and uh, and may not do very well. Yeah. You know, if we ever, Forrest, if you ever get your air conditioning and you see it in the junipers, now you know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far they haven't any of them been removed from the window. <laughs> Here. <laughs> but you, but you know what they're up to now. <laughs> oh, I know. I, I that, you know I am so glad that you clarified that for me, Will. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I'm here for. <laughs> All right, Tom, let's move on. All right, so going on to the next one. This is actually a really interesting one. I like this one. Has anybody observed Bigfoot hands, and in particular their nails? I'm actually wondering if they have nails or something stronger like claws just because of their reputed ability to take apart a carcass so quickly. I know yeah. apes have nails like humans, but given the reports of these creatures to rip apart animals so readily, it would seem that it would require something more like a claw with simple nail, you know, than simple nails. Uh, are there any okay. reports of them <laughs> well, I can... opening the whole side of a deer? I think it's brute force, but well, I can, what I do can, you guys think? I can tell you from personal experience witnessing um i didn't see the hands as much because the fingers were curled but uh you know the toe the toenails are going to be the same as the fingernails and they were they were nails very much like ours 
Well, and I, what I'm going to, I am going to suggest for the person that asked that question is, <clears throat> um, if they're, uh, they're apes and we're going, I'm going to work from that <laughs> assumption that they are a, a, a giant, giant bipedal ape and apes have, uh, nails just like all apes, monkeys, all primates except the lower, lowest of the, the simians and pro simians have, uh, they have nails, but they do grow. Uh, those the the lowest order do grow uh, claws. Now, where they might come in with a uh, a situation where you can look at <clears throat> go and look at some of these uh, videos where they have uh, videos of macaques and other monkeys and such. Their nails grow just like our nails grow, and let's face it. I don't know if you've seen some of those ladies out there with some of those fingernails. They can look like claws, trust me, with some of the fingernails that some people grow out there. Uh, our nails will grow to an immense length if they were not cut or uh, worn off. Now, in a situation where a Bigfoot uses its nails a whole lot, then they're probably going to wear down. But they can, those nails can grow out and they can almost appear like claws, which might, might uh, answer some of the, when you hear people sometimes say that, that their fingernails did look like claws, that would be the reason because they're just long fingernails is all they are. Well, and the other part of the question is, I think this person wants to know, um, how are they able to rip open a carcass? And I think it's sheer sure strength. Brute force. Yeah, brute force, yep, sheer strength. Force. Well, chimpanzees do it all the time to uh, uh, meet the, I mean, monkeys, and I've seen, and it's horrible. It really is. Uh, I've seen videos where these chimpanzees literally uh, rip living monkeys apart. They eat other monkeys uh, and, they will, and other animals, and they will literally rip them apart limb from limb and... Uh, so you're dealing with a chimpanzee that has, uh, you know, probably three to four times the strength of a human being will take another animal and literally rip their limbs off of them. And here, you know, share the meat around that way. And this animal's still alive. How, I mean, it's absolutely horrible, but that's exactly what Bigfoot would do. It's just brute strength. And it's got to be a lot of brute strength because you think about oh, yeah. it—the tendons and all the connective tissue and everything. That, that's some tough stuff. Well, and we even have a picture of a of a goat with its front leg ripped off. So, yeah, these things do occur. All right. So this person also wants to know: uh, Has Bigfoot ever been seen carrying a large carcass a long distance? Do they store their prey? Um, and hide it, you know, stash it away, you know, like a cougar might, or do they store the prey in trees and do they bury it? What are your thoughts? Well, we do know that they'll carry them, uh, away from where they kill the animal most often. So they, I, I'm sure that's probably so other predators don't, I mean, what's going to mess with the Sasquatch or a group of anyway, but, um, uh, they will take, they will take an animal actually several miles away from where they kill it. And we know that they do take the poachers kill. Oh, yeah. The poachers can't do anything about well, it. <laughs> well, even normal hunters. And you know, we've had plenty of accounts like that. And even, uh, you know, Randy in, in Canada, who was a moose hunter, we had that interview. And uh, one of the creatures stalked and killed a moose right in front of him. Well, how many and times have be... you heard about these <clears throat> hunters say that? You know that they shot a deer or an elk or whatever, and then the Bigfoot suddenly appeared and just picks up and either drags it off or throws it over its shoulder. Many times, uh, and and off they go. Yeah, that's you know? that's a pretty common. You're event. not going to argue with them, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sure, take it. Glad to have helped. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the grizzly bears in Alaska do the exact same thing. They've learned to uh, listen for uh, gunshots. They know what a gunshot means. That something's probably been killed. And they will actually listen for that, and uh, they will come, you know, of course, they, I don't know what the, the capacity for a Bigfoot being able to smell something, probably, I don't think it's too much greater than our own, but uh, uh, grizzlies have uh, 
can smell blood from a long distance away. And if they hear a gunshot and then start smelling blood, they're they're on your trail real quick. Dinner bell. Yep, dinner bell. <laughs> Dinner's been served. All right. And this person also wants to know, and, and this is an interesting question about tool use. Um, has anyone seen, has Bigfoot been seen using tools, either tools that they've made themselves or maybe some tools that they have lifted from humans and, you know, decided to use them for their own purpose? I don't know. I mean, you know, we, we have John on our, our other anthropologist and he says they must use tools. Well, I'm sure they do of some kind. It's probably things that we wouldn't recognize, but any tool is a man, it's manipulating anything in their environment. So it wouldn't be a tool like we think of a tool. It would be something we probably wouldn't recognize. Well, it's like chimpanzees right. pick, pick up rocks and break open nuts and uh, such as that. And uh, I've, I've watched uh, a lot of monkeys take uh, coconuts and they'll take and break those coconuts on sharp mm. rock edges and such. You know, that's a form of tool use. I mean, even taking a, 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 a piece of wood and whacking it upside of a tree, you can call that tool use. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's they're they're using it for a purpose and other than what it was originally designed so uh, i would imagine that their their use tool use is going to be pretty much limited to what you would see in chimpanzees taking a stick and sticking it down a um, termite hole to uh, pull termites out and i would think of course we don't have termite mounds in the you know in this area but uh you know they might do it for ants or such as that you know, ants are pretty tasty treats. Bears like them. Well, here, so, here's the thought, too. Um, um, you know, people talk about, you know, quote-unquote wood knocks. And, of course, everyone out there in the Bigfoot community is under the <laughs> assumption that's communication. Um, I don't I don't think that's communication. And, Tom, you know, we've recorded some of those in July. Um, yeah. What I think... They were not wood knocks, Will. No, but what, I, what I'm getting they're, around they're, to is what I think... <laughs> um, I think they're doing is it's probably has to do with some kind of food preparation. You know, maybe they're using a rock to break bones open. Maybe the, the younger ones, the juveniles, you know, maybe don't have the strength yet to do what the adults are doing or, you, you know, they're, they're prepping them in some other way, um, or, or vegetation or something. That's my thoughts anyway. Well, well haven't they re recorded them, uh, taking, uh, and possums and raccoons that, uh, you know, and grabbing them and, or even deer, for that matter, slaying them up against a tree and killing them. Oh, yeah. I, I talked to a state trooper years ago um, who found coyotes where they, they'd imitated coyotes, the calls, and drew the coyotes in and then grabbed them by their hindquarters and smashed their heads against alder trees. Hmm. Nice. Well, and the other thought that we had was, you know, when you hear this so-called, and what we heard wasn't, you know, and Will, you said this yourself. It wasn't wood knocking so much as it was tree smashing. Oh the no! Power and oh no! Not, not that night. And there were there were some other recordings that you sent me. Uh, oh, we, those. We recorded okay. a lot of stuff, and there's the guys are still going through it, folks. But um, one of those short recordings you sent me, like a five minute one, uh, where there, yeah. there were some of the bird noises in there, but there was also two very distinct noises like that that are some kind of yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we probably have other other noises like that recorded as well. But um, back, gigabytes, right? Back to my my original thought. There was, I, I think they're if they're doing that, it's probably involved in food preparation. So, don't be in the woods alone. Don't be one of I those want to be on that sources, end. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, don't what do we get next? Source of the noise. All right. Um, what kind of hunting behavior techniques do do Bigfoot use? Do they are are they pack hunters? You know, operate cooperatively. Uh, do they ambush, or drive them into a kill zone? Uh, does one group always hunt together? Uh, kind of all of the above. There, they they will hunt as a group cooperatively, and that in fact actually uh, there was a video of chimps. It's from the air, and it shows. I think it's with a um a thermal image because you see them you see them through the trees uh and they're actually hunting a smaller monkey and it's a very 
um, organized hunt. And, you know, they have the drivers and the outriggers, and then there's the, the one waiting in the kill zone. And, and they get, of course, it's very effective. They get the monkey. And what we hear with people being, you know, followed by the creatures, they often are, are hear the, the driver in the back making a little bit more noise maybe, and, and then occasionally the outriggers either walking or, you know, clacking rocks or making some kind of a noise. Um, I think with people mostly that's like, like, like cats, you know, when they, they're playing, that's actually practice for hunting. Uh, and these guys may do the same thing or something very similar course you would never hear about the person uh, the successful hunt because that person would be gone but (laughs) well that that dovetails in the next question here and have hunters hikers and will we could include another group in there ever found themselves in the middle of a bigfoot hunt where they were in the way yeah remember the guy we interviewed in texas where they they were killing deer around him or they were right? they were hobbling them. They would hobble the deer by breaking their legs. Then he would go in and grab more deer, and then he would come back and get the ones they hobbled. I, w- I was also thinking in terms of a uh, group of Bigfoot researchers uh, suddenly you know, with the window down here in a roar. <laughs> and anybody you have in mind runs there? Runs and growls. <laughs> What's that? Anyone you have in mind? <laughs> yeah, I don't well, know. That's kind of what I had in mind when I heard that was that. <laughs> certain couple of guys that i know hmm. <laughs> yes in, in july in july that did happen to us so it did it was interesting but we're not gonna... yeah, i gotta say it was the most uplifting fun lighthearted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and you took a democratic vote and how long did it take you to decide that you were leaving <laughs> well, we stuck around a little bit yeah, on that did. one because we had a truck right next to us <laughs> <laughs> oh. all right let's move um, on okay do they all right so follow-up question here he wants to know do they mostly hunt at night uh typically i mean yes mostly at night but typically uh around uh dusk and dawn time periods that's when the game is moving yeah Okay, are there areas of the country where Bigfoot are considered to be more aggressive or dangerous to humans? And where and why do you think that would be the case? Well, it seems to be uh, the ones, the the Type 2s in the southern part of the country seem to be more aggressive than, you know, the ones in the northwest. But uh, as to why, I'm not sure. Well, the ones in the northwest, I mean, when they attack somebody, it's, you just, you know, they end up on the, you know, their headline makers in the newspaper. So, <laughs> um, and well, are there any reports? Missing 411, and then nobody ever knows what the heck happened to them. <laughs> no, they just vanished. Just poof. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Are there any reports? I'm not sure why, why one variety would be more aggressive than another one. Hot yeah, climate down sorry. here makes them more aggressive? That could be. That could very well be. Well, you know, they say that about rapists and murderers. I mean, that the and the when it's hotter, that uh, you have more rapes and murders, and uh, than you do in, you know, colder climates. Oh, that's wonderful! It was ninety-eight here today. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's that's good to know. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose uh, I suppose that could make them a little more testy. <clears throat> Um, are there any reports of people surviving a Bigfoot a- attack? What happened, and how did they get away? Um, I I can think of one off the top of my head, and this comes from uh, the movie uh, Legend of Boggy Creek. You remember remember the guy T W actually T W actually knew, knew the guy uh, in the movie, yeah. the one that got um, uh, mauled. And, and the, what was what was his name? Sanger or Salcher or something yeah, like that? I can't, I can't remember what T.W. said his his actual name was, but I think I think they called him Ford in the movie, but uh, that wasn't his name. Anyway, he, he was he was mauled uh, more than what it showed in the movie, and uh, the creature just let go. It just it went away. Yeah, and they actually talked to him later. Uh, and, and life uh, here, and I can't remember where he ended up moving to, whether it was Oklahoma or, or out in uh, farther west in Texas, but uh, they actually interviewed that man 
and he verified the whole entire story. Yes, that he had, uh, you know, that that thing had attacked him. And uh, uh, they, I mean, those people moved out that night. I always thought it was interesting that it it beat him with the backs of its hands. Well, that uh, you know, we've discussed that before, but that's that's the way primates do. You know, they will grab. They will grab with their hands, just like a uh, human will. But when they fight, they don't they 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 don't make a fist like a a man does or a woman too, for that matter, and slug you. They actually swing and use the back of their hand. Yeah, makes sense. Apes and chimpanzees do that. Yes. Yep. Okay, Tom. Well, we're, oh, go ahead. TW's friend. Well, I was going to say we have another one. Uh, there's one that I was thinking of. I forgot, but. Um, there's also T.W.'s friend that got his finger bit off by oh, one of yeah, these things. Yeah, he actually, yeah, he actually fought the creature. Yeah, that I found that house, interesting. Too, he, it? What's that for us? I fought the Bigfoot and I won. Uh, <laughs> well, kind of won. Uh, he uh, wasn't that. Didn't that thing come in his house? It was. It got. Yeah. It got in the house. Yeah, he was sleeping. And whatever woke him up, he woke up and the creature was standing over him. And then it, I guess when it saw him awake, that it it sort of tossing him around like a rag doll. And he actually fought back. And at one point, uh, got his hand up by its mouth and it bit one of his fingers off. And eventually, it slammed him into a wall, and knocked him out. And I believe that's when he he woke up in the hospital. So, oh, wow. lucky to survive that account. So- I'd, I'd rephrase it. Lucky. I fought Bigfoot and Bigfoot won. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're oh you're not going to win. You, you might you might live. Somebody wrote a song about that a long time ago. You might ago. live, Similar but you're not going to gonna, not going to win. No, no. Um, okay, I'm under the impression that many of you consider Bigfoot to most likely be some type of higher ape and something more animal rather than having the human characteristics of higher consciousness or self-awareness uh what are your thoughts is that correct what do you think forrest uh, well my my i have said this over and over and, and that i think it is a uh a bipedal eight and uh that has uh, evolved that way now um i think that what we're dealing with is on a much higher level of intelligence than most of your other apes, such as gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans, gibbons. However, when I say this, we do know that we have Coco that could that learn ASL. Um, we have chimpanzees that work computers. Um, you know, intelligence lies in different forms, and um, to have them be able to go out and be a rocket scientist, no, I don't think that's going to happen, but their level of intelligence uh, and their environment, you could say, would probably be greater than ours would be. So... uh, environmentally speaking i think they're highly intelligent uh on the intellectual level not so much so we don't have any indication that they have a spoken language nor a a particular type of culture of course there's people that will argue that point and i always say if i find out different and don't let me forget tom what i told you about too to mention that later um that when I will be the first to stand up and say I'm corrected. I stand corrected. So, uh, anyway. And I would I would caution listeners who might argue the point. Uh, don't confuse, you know, what Forrest said about you know apes with what you've seen on television and movies with apes. Um, you know, a lot of times what we see is either packaged and processed or staged. It's not what the not what the creatures actually are. Exactly. All right, Tom, what else do we have? Well, yeah, and just the, <clears throat> excuse me, the follow-up question was, um, this is for Will and Forrest, do you think the creatures are self-aware? I'm sure they are to an extent. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Yeah. So they're they're a much higher higher primate than their, than your average smarter than your average ape. Okay. Yeah, they're they're not on the same level with chimps and gorillas and you know large apes. There's something something much higher than that, but they're not quite us either. No. And I don't, and <clears throat> saying that, I don't, and uh, again, some people are going to disagree with me. <clears throat> I don't think they're the missing link either. No. So, between apes and man. So, I think there's something that uh, developed all on their own, and um, they are what they are today. But they're not uh, the missing link. I agreed. Yeah, I don't see how anybody could come to the conclusion this is a missing link, and now we have evolved higher, but we have all these, uh, you know, we're weaker, we're smaller, yada, yada, yada. So, okay, <clears throat> do we have any sense of the relative population levels of the type 1 versus the type 2 in the western Rockies and the Appalachian mountain chain? No way, Are there no way of knowing. So these things don't take part in the census. They don't, by golly. I'm going to report them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are, there, are there any 10, 12-foot patty types in the, in the Appalachians that we know of? Hmm. I don't think anybody knows. Now, what, what was that question again, Tom? Patty types well, in the uh, Appalachians. Um, yeah, that are 10 to 12-foot. Um, in size. Well, yeah, I don't think we know. And I think eight, nine feet is the max that I've ever heard of anybody talk about them in Texas, too. That's still pretty huge, though. That's, that's, oh, well, that's pretty, yeah, you got that right. Yeah, places, places like Montana <laughs> you and Alaska. Look out your bedroom window and see that standing there. Places like Montana and Alaska have the big ones. Yeah, they they. I heard a native lady talk about seeing one that was fifteen feet tall, and I, I can't even comprehend that. Oh my gosh. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so this person says you've learned about the behavior, major areas of activity in the Appalachian chain. Uh, are there different, more aggressive, different diets, hunting migration? Uh, what's known about the creatures in the Appalachians? Well, it hasn't been a big focus of my work. Uh, I, I work mostly here on the West Coast, but um, I don't know how, how much it differentiates from what we have out here. I wouldn't think a, a huge amount. I wouldn't think that there'd be that much difference either. I don't think there's that much difference in... Uh, anywhere in the, the North American continent and even maybe in on other continents from one group to the other i mean now you the only differences might be uh you know and i'm a, uh, again it's it's uh physical i mean like the yowies are in uh, australia are going to look a little different because their uh genetic uh you know pool is going to be concentrated in that area and so therefore because they're always breeding uh you know, in that area, and obviously not going to North America to find a, a husband or a wife, uh, they're going to look a certain way. And I think that's probably your genetic pools. There might be some differences, but they're not going to be that great. And then you've got to take take into consideration where you're going to have genetic drift, where you have crossovers where uh, they're going to interbreed as well. So that'll in itself create another genetic pool yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't think i mean physically you're going to see some differences but behaviorally you know of course they're going to wherever the creatures are they're going to adapt to whatever the local wildlife and vegetation is in the terrain etc but uh but behaviorally overall they're probably going to be very similar oh yeah okay um all right so Martha wants to know, are there any indication that Bigfoot knows the migration patterns of big big game on purpose? Has it been observed? Um, 
are there only certain Bigfoot types that might do this? So I think she's referring to like deer, elk, bighorn sheep, and other animals like that. Um, would that, I think what she's asking is, would that be a motivation for these things to know that, to have that information and follow up on it for their feeding? Well, I mean, big cats in Africa, they follow the herd animals for very long distances they they kind of know when those patterns are are happening and they're going to follow the food well these creatures follow the food all the time and and we saw some of that about three weeks ago we did see that um okay so in the western states um they've built wildlife corridors and overpasses specifically for this Okay, so uh, I've heard of this. So a game can migrate uh, without having to get you know get hit by a car or something like that. Uh, this might be a great way to track Bigfoot. Uh, also, Bigfoot been seen going after buffalo or moose. Well, we know they go after moose. Um, why wouldn't they go after buffalo? I, th- I would think they would. Yeah, I would think so. I think um, they're going to go after anything that's edible. Yeah, and it might take a group, you know. I mean, some of those buffalo are pretty husky, but uh, I think that Bigfoot's very intelligent and resourceful. Okay, we got a, we've got about 20 minutes left, Tom. What do we got left? Okay, so just looking through here. I'm going to try to find some of the interesting ones. Okay, here's a question. When's your next podcast? That'll be tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which today is Tuesday. All right. Um, okay. So one of the questions is, does Bigfoot exist? We think they do, don't we? Well, I can verify that. <laughs> Will? Uh, say that again. What was that question? Does Bigfoot exist? Well, having seen three of them, yeah, I would say so. It's a rhetorical <laughs> question. I've seen one. No, I mean, uh, I, I understand fast. you people with the question. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not making fun of that, but yes. All right. I want to ask a question. What does William Jevening's opinion, what does he think the creatures, uh, oh, okay, what is making the three-toed impressions? Kind regards, Chris. <laughs> uh, he'll have to send me an email and I'll tell him. Okay, so you know which Chris we're talking about, yes. right? Okay. I know okay, what it can is. I say, can I say something there? Sure. It's a On velociraptor. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's what my first thought was, too. but um, And that was why I said, Tom, for you to remind me. And I'm going to interject something here real quick, because once upon a time, we had somebody ask a question about the the three-toed, the multi-toed, because I think we've had reports of having six toes and such as that. And I made the comment that when you have uh, genetic pools and you have inbreeding and such, it usually produces multiple toes. Well. I take a, an anthropological journal, and lo and behold, in, in this journal I get, talk, it talks about ectrodactyly. And lo and behold, there is a population of people in Africa called the Vadoma, and they're laid live in Zimbabwe. And one in every four children are affected by this and <clears throat> it is a mutation where they end up with they they often very unfortunately call lobster people and they actually produce either from three to two what appears to be toes because what ends up happening is the the the, the thumb and the first index digit uh, fuse together, and then the, and then most generally the other three digits will then fuse together, and this only happens in their feet, 
And I don't know why I didn't even think about this because I actually have a friend, a dear friend, that her grandchild has happened to, but they were they produced, but he this poor baby's hands and feet were affected. But there is a particular mutation that actually exists and that that produces that function. But this particular group of people have this happen to them, and it's literally in one and four children uh, are are born this way. And it doesn't seem to bother them in the least. It doesn't affect their walking or anything like that. They cannot wear shoes, but they, they don't, it does not affect their walking. So when their footprints appear, they appear to have either two or three toes on their foot. So it's kind of peculiar looking. So like I say, when I find out something that I need to be corrected on, and I'll be the first to correct myself on that. So, um, it's well, actually that's what a we dominant is... ge- uh, genetic mutation in this particular population of people. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, um, uh, yeah, I think that's what we appreciate about you and, and people that can say, hey, listen, uh, I got some new information and here's what the new information is. And I'm not going to be entrenched in my previous statement. So, yeah, that's great. We, we, we like that. We appreciate that. Um, okay. This person wants to know, Nathan wants to know, what is a skunk ape? Is it a type 3 or something else? Uh, are the creatures in hot, swampy south different than the other Sasquatch types? It's That's most likely just a, maybe a slight variation on the type 2s that are in the south. Probably a little bit, a little bit different. Well, uh, and we had Dave on. We've had him on a couple times uh, a while back, and he's, you know, he's a witness to to these things. And there's a there's plenty of people. I mean, there's plenty of sightings um, in in Florida, and I I think other areas in that area, you know, in the southeast. Right. Oh, and they've had sightings where multiple people have uh, seen them. I mean, uh, they had one sighting where this thing was walking across a, a marsh. And, I mean, the, the when the news, I mean, people that were actually, when the news actually uh, put the pictures out there, there was um, somebody with their phone scanning, and it was like 20 people that had pulled off the side of the road and was actually watching this creature walk across the, the marshland. Wow. So, well, but, but don't they say that, I mean, and I, correct me, Will, if I'm uh, wrong on this, don't they say they tend uh, in Florida ha- to have more of a orangutan appearance? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, a good, a good friend of mine was a witness there. He actually shot at one, uh, and he said that's that's what it looked like. So I, I, I it, it kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, where you have, uh, these populations that are pretty much uh, centrally localized, and they're uh, you're not gonna you're gonna have a gen- specific genetic pool that they're going to be working off of. So you're not gonna have so much dimorphic uh, a variety within that uh, uh, pool. So they're gonna look maybe slightly different from the guys out here in East Texas and up in the Northwest or even up in the Northeast. So. But they're okay. all the same, same guy, they're all the same, <laughs> same creature. <laughs> and the skunk apes, we know that they also steal air conditioners. That's so right. Keep an eye well, on in Texas. They do. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tom. Um, okay. So do Sasquatch always exhibit the same five toe uh, foot pattern? Uh, typically, I've, I've yes. Been noted. Typically, yes. Okay. It's, most Typically, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that is, well, and briefly, Will, can you comment on how you can track different creatures? For example, Patty was tracked in all the way up into southern Oregon. What well, wasn't tracked. Um, the creature's footprints were found uh, in 1980 up near the California-Oregon border. But, but it wasn't tracked up there. 
the footprints are unique like fingerprints. Even ours are unique like fingerprints. Um, they, they can be, you can identify individuals by their footprints. Okay. Um, all right. Comment and a question. I heard about a report put out by a university professor. I think he's talking about Krantz in the Pacific Northwest uh, about the black bear population of Bigfoot. Basically, the data of Bigfoot sighting frequency and black bear populations were strongly related. Uh, then concluded that black bear population is probably a good marker for the presence of Bigfoot population in an area. They have similar prey and eating habits. Well, um, so Will, what, what's your thoughts? <laughs> well, well Krantz, Krantz was kind of using the swag method on that. <laughs> we all know what the swag method is. Um, well, and it's more, and that's a, that it wasn't even a capital S, was it? It was more of a wag method. Well, you know, the, the scientific <laughs> wild blank guess. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say just a wild old guess, but all right. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, he, I, I knew Grover, and he, he speculated a lot. And, and I understood where he was going with that, but, um, you know, he was trying to make a correlation based on diet. You know, comparing comparing a primate to a bear, and I think that's uh, that's something that's not, you know, it's not uh, accurate. Well, it doesn't seem to be applicable in, in this situation with Bigfoot. I don't think. No, I don't think so either. I mean, because their intelligence levels and there's just a lot of differences between the two. I mean, you can't you can't compare them just on diet alone and, and make an estimation about population. No, you can't even do that with other monkeys because, I mean, like within uh, 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 macaques, you've got so many different varieties of macaques and their different uh, feeding habits are, you know, it's, it's, it's going to vary from one group to another. Yeah, e even in the same area, right? Same region, you have different groups and it would be different right. per group. Exactly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a problem that people do. They even people with degrees they they'll make generalizations, and you really can't do that without, you know, some more uh, information to support those ideas. Well, the unfortunate thing is with, uh, uh, and I find this all the time, and I know you do too, Will. That with uh, you start dealing with people with <laughs> degrees and <laughs> higher education, uh, that. Uh, I get frustrated because I go out there and I, I know stuff was discovered uh, 20, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, but yet you can't find anything on it. And then all of a sudden it's there. Oh, it's because the, the accolade, the intellectuals have been looking at it and studying it and doing this and that and the other with it until they can present it to the public. You know, I don't understand why they just don't throw it out there and let everybody just put their two cents work down, right. you know? Because that's what they've been doing, yeah. and 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 I've said over and over, one of the best archaeologists I ever worked with, uh, and bless his heart, I don't know where Bob is today, but uh, I swear to God, that man uh, could find a site faster than any person I knew, and he had nothing more than a high school education. Right, you, you know, I, and he helped us write a manuscript on a site. So you know, I, I, a lot of times I will tell you, education is nothing. I mean, experience is all. I um. Uh... I always think about one of my favorite Rene de Hinden sayings, and he used to crack me up when it would say it because he would, he thought it was funny as hell, and he'd get tears in his eyes laughing about it. But he'd say, you know, some he says someone walks up to me and says they have a PhD. I say, what's the prognosis? And they look at him quizzically and say, <laughs> what do you mean prognosis? And he, he'd get this innocent look on his face, like, oh, you know, uh, he says, well, I thought you, I thought you said you had incurable brain disease. <laughs> <laughs> That was that was one of his favorite ones. Oh heavens! Well, Tom, I think we well, I think we have time for. I probably, think that's a wrap because are we out of questions? I we're out of questions. Well, we uh, but I want to say, folks, keep them coming. We love the questions, and even if you don't think it's a good question, if you don't ask it, uh, you got to ask it. It's it keeps the topic alive and going. So questions at creekdevil.com absolutely if you've had an encounter you know don't be afraid to talk to us about it or uh 
you know, at least uh, at least privately, we'd like to hear from you. All right, guys, any final thoughts before we wrap this session? I think this is a very good session. Good questions as usual. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, very much so. All right, folks, that'll do it for this time. Uh, stay tuned for the Bigfoot and History Show this week. In Bigfoot history, the Dalles, Oregon, May 1967. Dennis Taylor told Roger Patterson that he and several other youths had frequently watched the Sasquatch cross the freeway near the cemetery, going from the hills to the river at about 11.30 p.m., and back up about 4 a.m. Sometimes there was more than one. They several times shot at these creatures with various weapons, and once one was knocked down with buckshot at close range, but leapt up and ran through a barbed wire fence, taking out three posts. They said the creature usually seen was nine feet tall and must have weighed half a ton. Its eyes glowed red. Bigfoot Still on March as Experts Try Explanations by Betty Allen, Humboldt Times Correspondent, October 31, 1958. Willow Creek. Almost every conversation one hears around here either begins on the subject of Bigfoot or soon swings around to him. We presume Bigfoot is a him. In this northern area of California, there is considerable speculation as to just what or who is making the great tracks. They say is a favored expression, and the they say authorities are filled with theories. Many of those who have actually seen the tracks taking off down the roadway are split into two camps. There are those of the confirmed school of thought that the whole thing is a hoax, a wonderfully conceived hoax. On the other hand, there are those who have been converted to the side of the room which believes that the tracks are real, as the shoes they have on. So far, the whole thing is fraught with mystery. Those who believe in a hoax and those who think the tracks are real are in deadlock. They say, the source of authority who isn't sure but talking, that the tracks are made by spacing carved feet a certain distance apart on the treads of a tractor or on a roller used to smooth the road. Is that possible? Where is this piece of equipment kept? None have seen such a contraption. Individual measurements show some tracks to be 60 inches apart, some 52 inches, and others at 40 inches apart. Here and there, they show on one side and the other sometimes is a small mound of dirt. Sometimes, the tracks step easily up or down the rough terrain. It is not necessarily in the path of a roller. In other places, the tracks are within inches of the edge of the road. In others, in varying distances from the oiled rig or trucks. The ground may be that which tractors have run over. Sometimes, the surface is perfectly smooth. The weight of the entire foot track varies in depth and according to the surface on which Bigfoot has been walking. It doesn't respond to the... This part of the article's column was cut off. The case of the wooden feet that they say are in existence, if true, they must be magnificent models of workmanship. Each toe is separate. Tiny lines of the human foot are visible. The one asks if the toes are hinged to give the startling realism of action observed in the big tracks. There are those who answer with a yes. On Thursday morning, the latest evidence debunks a lot of mechanical claims. That morning the big tracks of Bigfoot were observed plunging down a side of the hill in the roughest of shale. There was a huge dug-in. The weight caused the feet to slide. What a way to treat someone's carefully developed mechanical handiwork. There is $1,000 which could go to the fund for the badly needed hospital project of the Community Health Association at Hoopa if the wooden feet could be located, proven to be wearable to produce Bigfoot's tracks. So far, the quest for them has been fruitless, as Coronado's search for the famed Seven Cities of Cibola. 
They say the men working on the construction project in the Bluff Creek area are carrying rifles. The rugged mountain wilderness, with its known population of bears and panthers, would make it appear only good sense to have a gun nearby. They say no proof is available that the men working there either believe or disbelieve in the existence of an outsized man or animal. But it is always nice to have a rifle nearby. To say you believe the tracks are genuine, or that you have heard or seen anything unreal, in wrong company, only brings a chorus of head-shaking and ridicule. There should be some serious investigation to definitely determine the status of the mystery of Bigfoot. It should be solved, if an answer is at all possible. Until then, the they-says and the doubters will have a picnic poo-pooing the convinced. Of course, this won't stop Bigfoot from making his tracks, because he is out of earshot anyway. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's william, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.